appreciate that. Is that helping at all? Yeah, okay. Okay. Thanks very much, and it's great to see the bee crowd here. You have such an active and nice group. Um, so, okay. So yeah, I'm going to, um, starting a little bit late, so I'm going to kind of wing into this, but uh, I'm going to talk about some projects that we have in the lab and also general projects in the community that have effort, attempted to address bee health, uh, but with a slant towards more genetic projects or projects that are using um, genetic tools to understand both honeybees and also the uh, the various biotic threats that, that come into their lives. And of course, this is one of the dramatic uh, uh, representations of honeybee uh, exodus as it were from a hive. And, and there's been a lot of uh, interest in bees lately, more so than, than, than maybe cyclopee, even Eric would remember. Um, because there have been some crises within bee health, and also, of course, a greater awareness of the importance of honeybees to the economy and to agriculture, uh, as well as the environment. One of the um, sort of buzzwords that reached, buzz or words that reached the forefront uh, now about eight years ago was colony collapse disorder, which was a syndrome, uh, a, a, a renaming, as it were, of a syndrome by which uh, worker bees within a colony leave the scene fairly quickly quickly enough that beekeepers would notice uh, brood remaining in the colony that had to have been provided for by workers that, that had died within the last couple of weeks or so. So there's there's this um, strange and strange syndrome associated with bee losses. And then also a, a sort of a sense that the bees across the world, and uh, domesticated honeybees at least, were um, declining, that there were losses that were at higher rates than they had been historically. Um, and that's the, the loss rate, the yearly uh, sort of colony loss rate for bees certainly is high and it's, un, it's, it's not a good situation for beekeeping. That is beekeepers, commercial beekeepers need to replace colonies lost annually because they need to provide a certain set number of hives for pollination and of course if they're making any of their economy or if they're on honey production, they need those hives there. So this loss rate, which is in many cases 30, 40, 50 percent of the hives each year, is is very um, it's damaging to the beekeeping industry. It doesn't mean that honeybees as a species are disappearing from the face of the earth. Um, unlike uh, and, and there we have to look at maybe other pollinators where where there really is a true loss of a true risk of extinction. Honeybees are holding steady, but it's only because of lots of extra work by the beekeepers and efforts to. Um, and, and an economy that actually sustains them. And, and so to, to reduce those impacts, especially on the, the beekeeping um, uh, beekeepers themselves, we have several options to address these losses. And this is, these are a few of them, uh, controlling known bee diseases and, and stress better, uh, continuing this sort of a forensic attempt to understand why beehives fail, honey beehives fail, uh, protecting them from environmental stress or toxins, pesticides that come uh, in, into greater awareness because of this, uh, breeding better bees, of course, and then um, as, a, as a carrot for the, the thousands and thousands of other species to, um, to also look into other pollinators. Um, what our lab is focused on are the first two, and so we're really trying to look at the diseases that bees face, biotic threats from viruses to other arthropods, uh, and to to reduce those, either through breeding or especially through management of those threats. And then uh, we do have this undercurrent, especially our lab had this uh, diagnostic service going for some for decades, really. And so we have an undercurrent of research trying to understand new losses of colonies and see if we can trace that to to an agent, to a biological agent, or um, or another cause. This is harder to read. This is just the the. Uh, Sort of post office listing of the most wanted pathogens and parasites of honeybees uh, from the viruses on the left in, in two main families of RNA viruses and bees and some unclassified species. Bacteria, some of which are, are um, cause recognizable disease in bees, fungi, protozoa, and then of course the arthropods, the other, um, the mites and, and beetles that are parasites on bee hives. The, the colony level losses were striking uh, both because of the, the um, degree of them in some apiaries and also, again, the way they happen, the way that the beehives 
lost this sort of mass population of workers in short order um, without showing, without presenting the usual symptoms that we might see with disease or, or even with, with an acute pesticide threat. Um, so our group, this is Don Lopez in, in our lab who uh, ran many of these tests. We were sort of given one charge to take samples from these declining colonies and try to figure out if we could use a genetic screen, a way to figure, to post hoc determine what might have been um, a factor in those losses. And, and this is the, the gory truth of it. We, we went out in the field somewhere, but most of the time we get frozen samples coming in and we mash up 50 or 100 bees and simply forage in those bees for any sign of microbes, especially that were that were candidates for, for hurting bee health. And this is um, one upshot of that where we used RNA sequencing, so sort of a really unbiased backing off from the knowledge of bee pathology, backing off and saying, let's just look at as much as possible and see if anything uh, sticks to the wall as being a cause for this. Um, and a few things were evident in these colonies. They, they truly did have higher parasite and pathogen loads, higher levels of many of these RNA viruses. Um, and, and more interestingly, the samples we had from California looked different from the samples from Pennsylvania or Florida or even Texas. And so there's something going on whereby colonies were picking up levels of parasites and pathogens, but the actual species that were at least implicated at this stage of decline, the species were different in each place. So that, uh, at one point, is kind of depressing because it means you, you don't have a single viable cause of this. But it also pointed to the fact that, that these bees were getting some sort of greater risk to, to biological threats. Um, this pattern is replicated. This is a more recent survey from Tur Turkey. Uh, same idea. Different regions had parasites and pathogens at higher levels in declining colonies, but the actual species were not the same across these regions. Um, and it doesn't make sense, uh, per se, as a, as a sweep of a species through a population, which is what many of us had kind of put our, put our chips on, was that there was a new virus, a new trait that was coming to the population. If that's happening, it's not um, evident from sort of these survey works in the sense that there are other viruses that, that show up in different parts of, of almost any survey I think that's gone on this one. Um, there is one. Uh, Possibility, one way out of this hypothesis or to support it, and this will be for Brian with his uh, evolutionary genetic background. But if you look within those species, so we, we kind of categorize things as you know, cashmere bee virus or, or the chalk root fungus, but if you look within those species, you do start to see signs that particular ones might actually be um, have strains within species, especially the viruses might actually be acting as a sort of sweep through a population type of disease. And, and the, actually walk. Um, the pipeline for this, in this case, was, was it's very subtle in this case, but these are just sort of nucleotide divergences across strains of viruses that we've seen inside of these. And if you look at these uh, CCD plus Bs and CCD minus ones for one virus species, um, IBV, this yellow bar that's quite a bit shrunken down, and even the green bar to some extent, these are the third uh, position nucleotide variants within these sequence liners. And it's basically suggesting that, that irrespective of selection for maybe an extra virulent strain, that strain is homogeneous. There was something in those populations that was, um, the virus diversity was less, as it were, than it was uh, in the other sample population. So we think that's a sign that, that maybe particular, um, again, a particular strains of triggered variants are causing disease. Um, yet to be proven in any of these cases. One needs to really go back and do what the plant people do or other other um, commodities or you inoculate with the different strains and, and really prove that some are worse than others. Um, so that's that's all I'd like to say about the survey work. Uh, the bees are actually poor patients for this sort of work because well, many of them have left, the, left our planet uh, in those colonies because of the decline. But it's also very hard to sample the whole superorganism of the colony to get a disease, right? We can do 50 bees, which we thought was really exciting to do that many, but that's still, of course, a small, small fraction of the colony. We're probably missing things because of just the difficulty of sampling. Um, and we do think there might be signs of a strain times disease um, covariance. Another neat result that came with this, and again, this is a, now dozens and dozens of people 
lasered in, the laser-like focus on B disease. Uh, there, were, there were some longitudinal studies where people looked at colony declines at actually marking individual bees, sort of anticipating doomsday for those colonies. And, and in this neat study by Benjamin Benat, um, what it showed, is, again, a little bit subtle on the graph, but the colonies that ended up failing at the end of the winter um, had some bees that lived all the way through to the colony just gave up the ghost and died. And where the mortality was, was in kind of middle-aged bees, you know, 30, 40, 50 days out um, from when they did be closed as adults. And so there's something, whatever it's doing, there's something affecting middle-aged uh, kind of bees that we have to figure out what's going on. Um, as with the survey studies, though, it's sort of we get the result, and then we have to scratch our heads and, and um, go back to wonder what's going on with the mechanisms there. And here's another favorite quote that uh, the beekeepers were giving us food for it. I don't know if we can hear it, but uh, the quote is, uh, excuse me, but did the word think actually come out of your mouth? Um, because we're, <laughs> we're actually doing a lot of work, a whole lot of work, and at the end we have to, you know, I don't think there was a lot of time sitting back on our heels and wondering what it all meant and how to move forward. And I think after the, the first kind of mania for colony collapse disorder, people did move on to plan B, which was to think about these syndromes and, and what's going on, but also to design experiments that will rationally test um, hypotheses. And so I just want to cover four angles that way, four avenues for looking at bee health that are maybe not inclusive. You know, I don't have pesticides up there. I don't have um, some really nice um, you know, insights into bee nutrition, things like that. But I just want to say these are, these are I think, four manageable tasks that, that um, we've been engaged with to try to try to sort out um, meaning for, for uh, why the colonies have failed, but also more importantly to to see if we can separate out those factors. So the first one is the, the sort of the toxic couples. So this idea that pesticides by themselves are not clearly not in and of themselves, um, and I'd say most of the time it's true, not causing colonies to vanish from higher age areas. They're, they're having an impact on colonies, but if it were the case that a single chemical was always causing bee declines, I, I truly think we would have seen it by now. I don't think there's, um, I doubt that we would have made that connection. Nevertheless, there, there, there is this opportunity or possibility that, that certain abiotic exposures to pesticides couple with certain pathogens and parasites, and there's, there's some very nice experimental work with, um, in this case, fipronil in Osema, and then in, in um, another study with, with uh, imidacloprid and Osema, some sort of idea that, that those two together have a, a, a non-additive, <coughs> worse than additive effect on bee health, and that's a, a really critical avenue that people are looking at. Um, the other way is to also approach it um, from the bee health standpoint and say, well, certainly, you know, it's terrible news that 30% of bees are, are declining the point of empty boxes, but a good fraction of bees and even a good fraction of populations are staying healthy. And so trying to understand what beekeepers can do and what we can do scientifically to find out to simply improve management of those bees and to, to avert some of those losses. And this is the um, one sort of schematic for under for thinking about that and that's uh, exploiting and, and this isn't unique. There's many um, avenues of uh, people looking at different honeybee defenses by which the bees themselves, when faced with these dire threats, can mount defenses and we can actually help to, to improve those. Um, certainly immunity by the individual bees in the middle once they're infected is important. Uh, hygienic traits, abilities to keep the hive as free of disease as possible. Uh, and then finally, there's a really interesting undercurrent right now, looking at the hive environment and the other, what we, the, again, the agrobiologists call the holo genome, which is not the genome of the bee itself, not the genome of a virus or of a varroa mite, but the whole, the whole of that, and trying to understand with these interactions with, with um, the microbes in the hive, which ones are benefiting bee health and which ones are, are negative on bee health. Um, and so that avenue is really made great leaps in the last seven or so years. Uh, in part from, from importing talent, we have Nancy Moran, who's a professor now in Texas, uh, has devoted a lot
lot of her energy to this and really changed uh, the outlet for it by, by um, bringing her uh, skills of uh, microbial genomics into it. We also have uh, better experimentation, I think, now. So we have, um, historically, we've grown, I think, very good at, at inoculating bees with the bad, the bad bacteria that they might face, viruses, uh, and the parasites like mites. Now we have really good techniques, I think, for for inoculating bees with with the whole of their their bacterial complements or their microbial complements, and then following those with with the tools. Um, I'm going to talk about two experiments that we've done, and these really were serendipitous. They were from conversations with Nancy and getting cultures of bacteria that that looked promising. Uh, one was run by Ryan Schwartz in the lab. This was a uh, Again, this is, um, I do some stuff in the field, but this is probably the, the most biological stuff we've been doing the last couple of years, which is to rear newly emerged bees in these sterile plastic cups and do good and bad things to them. And what we're doing here is to inoculate them with one of this, the seven or eight predominant gut bacteria that bees carry, inoculate them with that one, and then see how they fend off different diseases. And there's there's a history of this in other insect studies where when they have these good bacteria in their guts, <coughs> by in some cases mysterious means, they're able to fend off other bad parasites and pathogens. Um, this is with uh, microbiota. It's actually Crithidia there. It's now we've recently renamed the, this uh, trypanosomatid parasite of bees, Lachmaria. Uh, it's a it's a common gut parasite of honeybees. And in this case, when you challenge bees with, with Lachmaria, this the trypanosome, they do, it grows less well when they also have one of these seven or eight bacteria. And we think it's additive with the other bacteria. So, so this bacterial complement somehow provides a buffer against a gut parasite. And this one kind of made sense because the bacteria actually coat uh, parts of the gut wall, especially in the ilium, this species coats the ilium in just the place that these trypanosomes start to make their adhesion and, and entry into the, to the system. So, so it kind of made sense, not a cure-all for that disease by any means, but it actually has helped um, the diseases reduced by having these bacteria. A more exciting project was actually done by an undergraduate student, Juliana Berga, and this one um, <coughs> started, and I don't have the, the all of the data here, I'm sorry to say, but this is, she's working to write this up soon. It started from a correlational study where we actually found virus loads were lower in bees that had certain levels of, of these gut bacteria. And, and there's, again, there's a history of that in fruit flies, there's a virus disease that's reduced by having endogenous bacteria. Well, forget about the, the gut parasites that are in the gut, like Nosema and the trypanosome. Let's see if it does things against viruses. And we did this project where we actually, uh, it was sort of a, a semi-field project. We inoculated bees with pure culture of the bacteria. And then we, we actually fed them. We didn't inject them with virus in this case. We would feed them virus and put them out into hives for a couple weeks. So this is the, um, the setting for, for virus growth. And we would measure viral growth with and without a pre-inoculation of this bacterium and go through it with a vacuum and basically snarf up every single painted bee uh, from those colonies. So we get that, and we get pretty good returns on the bees. Um, we didn't see a difference in mortality, but we saw a significant difference in viral load. So bees, given these quote unquote good bacteria at the start, had lower virus loads at the end. Uh, and this, as you can imagine, is not a direct interaction, right? The bacteria never eats the virus. The virus is um, in the, intracellular and it moves into the system. And the bacterium, we think what's going on is it's triggering an immune response that then helps uh, with, with uh, viral resistance. Um, and there's there's a neat word now, actually, um, some beekeeper work in Canada trying to test adult bee probiotics against these sorts of diseases. Um, and that's highlighted here. This is actually Google from this morning. Uh, so if you can buy it, these are human, of course, bacteria, but you can buy them at Walmart and Office Depot. So, so I think there is there is an avenue there to maybe at least ensure that that um, whether it's packaged bees uh, or or small isolates of beehives or even hives themselves that might not have picked up those bacteria to ensure they have the right complement of bacteria um, seems 
seems like a good, a good question. Um, the other uh, corollary to that, and there's, again, Nancy's group did a neat study recently, is that perhaps antibiotic use, uh, long-term sort of maybe prophylactic antibiotic use, does seem to impact these, and it could change those bacterial communities as it does in other agricultural systems. And, and we don't know the impacts of that on defense. So there may be a, uh, another avenue for, for using this bacteria only when properly prescribed. And very briefly, I want to mention a study about a, another interaction that I think is also going to um, reach a point of the management solutions. And, and it, it has it's been posited for a while, but now there's really clear evidence that bees given good nutrition, these are honeybees given um, an extra pollen supplement or native pollen, even better, actually tend to reduce their virus loads. My take on this is they might actually be then favoring a healthy growth of these bacteria and that, that's what drives the viral reduction. But it could simply be that the, the physiologically fit bees are able to keep down viruses. So it's, it's again, a way that um, intuitive for the beekeepers that, that good nutrition is can't be bad for bees, of course, and it's good for bees, but it may also be something that could be prescribed as there's a risk for virus uh, levels, not just when there's a need to build up bee numbers or to help the bee hive. So I think, oops, I think that's been really exciting work, and it, and it remains to be seen how this works, if it's something about the, um, again, the physiology of the bees or just, just the way it Okay, so now, and actually for the, the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on, on the number one target of many of the controls, or many of the worries, of, as it were, for bee health, and also a focus of our group right now, which is, is the varroa mite. And this is a, a story that continues to get worse and worse. Varroa mites are now uh, in most of the island populations of honeybees. They're, they're traveling with us humans uh, accidentally. Throughout, they're, they're not yet, but imminently will be in Australia, and that'll be the last kind of major chunk of land that doesn't have this as an impact on honeybees. Uh, and wherever they go, they lead to increased chemical use uh, to, to protect the bees from the mites, and generally poor fates for the honeybees where they, they meet up, especially when they newly arrive in a population, and those bees might not have um, had prior experience of prior resistance. So they're a huge uh, threat to beekeeping, um, and they're, they're not going away. Um, two avenues that, that seem to work for this are to look at uh, breeding bees that are resistant. This is a very early, a 1992 study that successfully did that, which is promising so you can actually get a bee. Honey, the European honeybees have not been exposed to Varroa, now Varroa destructor. Uh, for a very, very long time, thousands, millions, maybe of years. So there is a sense that, that there, um, as Mia actually pointed out this morning from many Rittner's very earlier claims, they're like, um, they're, they're, they don't have it in them to resist this mite because it's so new and so different from other parasites they've had. Counter to that, almost anywhere people have tried, they've found ways to, to increase resistance to this mite. Um, whether it's by the development of the bees, the change in the colony life history, reducing brood levels for certain times, or hygienic behaviors. And so the, the exciting part is that these traits are in the bees, um, and there are people who are relaxing sort of the, the other controls for the mites, the parasitic mites, such that some of these traits we think are coming into the population. Uh, I did want to show one success story by another uh, mostly indoor biologist, Greg Hunt, at Purdue University. But Greg has uh, also a very good ability to work with breeding groups, of honeybee breeding groups. And uh, as part of this, it's sort of a heartland queen breeders thing society. They started selecting just a couple of few years ago for traits in those bees, behavioral traits that would uh, limit the impacts of varroa mites. And they call them mite biters or ankle biters. Um, and the, the definitive trait is that many people in, in both determining whether to treat chemically for mites and also looking at resistance traits will count the number of mites in the hive, mostly on the bottom of the hive where they fall more or less out of the system. 
they did something, which, which again has been done, but they, they looked specifically at those mites and tried to determine which mites were sort of bee handled as they as they died. So which mites were put out of the system by some effect of the bees, presumably biting the legs off or nipping at them to, to pull them off their, their sister bees. And so they screened them with a with a a metric of mite damage. Not so much the mite numbers, mite fall and such, but they actually measured the damage to those mites and determined breeding stock that had more damage than average or more than the rest of the population. And the truly amazing thing, that, and I'm now convinced that any sort of resistance trait, even in honeybees that haven't been exposed to a certain threat for a long time, uh, any of these traits are, while well, the genetics are complex, there are many genes involved, there are continuous traits, any of them can be pushed into the population. What, what this study found that was striking is there seemed to be no end. They were able to get over a threshold after a couple years where they could push this up to 40 or 50 percent of the mites in this colony, these breeding colonies, that had that trait that were, or, or, yeah, 50 percent of the colonies showed mites that had been uh, ravaged by the bees in their colony. So the bees had bitten their legs off and knocked them down. So it's one a good trait that beekeepers can use, and maybe more encouragingly from the genetic standpoint, it's one that's so highly heritable and, and perhaps dominant in a sense genetically that the, the returns on those efforts are really high. Like they, they were able to bring their bees up to a high rate. They're now working, as, as with any such project, to see if that really um, survives the, the test of time, if they can take those resistant lines, put them back in the field and get better um, survival. But it looks, it looks, it truly looks promising. I actually have it still. So, um, I think most of you have probably seen something like this. Um, but this is, this is the sort of trait that, that um, Here, this picture, one of them here has this big frisky sized mite on her body. And this bee here is just going like crazy trying to find that mite. She can smell it, she can sense it perhaps, and she's trying to get the mite that's on the on her nestmate. And in these breeding stocks, they're not just going after that mite and you know seeing if they can knock it off, they're pulling it off and chewing it to bits. So it's just a really cool kind of extension of hygienic behavior by bees that, again, could be um, uh, exploited as a way to get a little bit better. Okay, sorry. Um, another uh, avenue for this, and, and one that, that uh, Judy Chen and myself in Maryland are, are really keen on, is, is built on the fact that the mites themselves are, you know, blood sucking parasites. But what they do, as with the malaria mosquito, as with many of the plant sucking bugs, is they transmit viruses, they transmit disease to their host, to the, the host that the mice feeding on. And we started a project with one bee breeder, and we're actually trying it more broadly now, to look at their survival, the stock that survives really terrible mite levels. So mice that are um, physically on the bees, as in the bee on the right, that's a mite on her back. And nevertheless, they're they're not yet out of business. So somehow those bees are surviving these these threats and mites. And one viable option is that the, the bees tolerate these mites. They eat a little extra to survive the blood loss. They somehow make it through. But their their trait, their strength is really in tolerating or resisting the viruses that the mites are actually injecting into the body. And this uh, looks promising in this particular population. On the left side are levels of deformed wing virus that we know is transmitted by mites. And sure enough, bees that were in a um, susceptible population tended to, to just harbor higher virus levels for that virus. Um, what was more interesting, the virus in the middle isn't transmitted by varroa mites, it's black queen cell virus. And it too was higher in these susceptible populations than the resistant ones. So we, we thought, well, this is great. This is a case where there might well be a generic virus resistance that can be added to the mite 
resistance if, if, if and when that exists to make them hardier bees. Um, so we did a study with, with this bee breeder whereby they sent home sections of developing bees from what they termed six resistant and six susceptible lines uh, from their populations. Uh, we didn't, one, we didn't have enough mites really to do this quantitatively, it's a challenge to it, and two, we kind of wanted to throw the mites out of the equation. So we did this by injection. We injected pupil bees with a virus soup, a soup of, of viruses, or just with a saline buffer solution. Um, and these are the results, and they're not, you know, dropped and pretty, but, but they, um, I, I think they're showing something going on physically within these bees. And this is, um, uh, the, the, the bee are actually very scientifically for his bad bees, and these are good bees, which um, doesn't matter so much because the bee breeder, in this case, their prediction of which bees would be more resistant to viruses versus less didn't hold up so well. And I'll show you why. There's, um, this, is a, this is what you might expect from a bad bee line. The number of bees, uh, these are, sorry, the blue dots are for control bees given the saline. The reds are the ones that were given this, this soup of viruses. And the virus levels went through the roof. This is a quantitative estimate of viruses. So they went up much higher than those. Than those. And here as well. Here's one where they had a, some of the bees certainly carry virus. And this is a very frequent virus in populations. But it didn't go up at all, even though we gave them this pretty hefty dose of, and an inoculum of viruses. So on average, that colony, there was no change in the virus matter with, with the dose. Here's another one where it went up. Here's another one where it's more diversity, but it didn't change again. And we see that uh, in the good isolates or strains as well. Again, here's one where there's virus present, but it didn't get any um, worse, as it were, when we fed them. And these are, these are doses that we know uh, generally cause uh, an abundance of virus growth in the bees. It's going right into their hemolymph, lots of viral copies, and it should have made them very sick, and in some cases it didn't. Um, one way to look at that, uh, to look at the mechanism behind that, is to look at how the bees react to this inoculum. And these are just, um, if you've seen RNA sequencing plots, or even for microarrays, these are, in this case, genes, or parts of genes upregulated uh, with among resistant bees, and then downregulated or actually upregulated in the susceptible bees, however view you want to take of it. Um, what's, what's interesting here, and, and sort of sobering for making this something that maybe a bee breeder could use, is that we didn't see a lot of change between the bees when we gave them the saline. The real meaty stuff is down here. These are actually just scales. So, so basically, there's a lot, a lot going on between these two classes of bees when you give them the actual virus challenge, which fits again with the fact that they're differently able to deal with these viruses. But it, it, um, uh, it and we think it's offering some insights into how they're reacting to a virus. Really. Um, another way of looking at it: don't worry so much about the um, the labels on these, but just uh, that this is a. a categorizing the genes that are changing expression, compare that to here. These are genes changing in, in expression when these were given the actual true virus, the direct virus inoculum. Uh, it's really hard to read. There's, there's phagocytosis, VSRNA transport, um, some of the metabolism, wound healing, autophagic cell death. There's a whole bunch of meaty gene families or processes in there that are different between the resistant and susceptible bees. So we think this approach is finding some of that resistance. There have been other efforts too to find responses to disease uh, that I think we can all start comparing them together and see what's, con what's consistent. Uh, and then logistically, it also means that you don't get these, uh, it, this sort of view of the bee bodies when you use saline or a sort of surrogate for a challenge. You have to use the actual virus, which is, which is kind of a pain for. Um, proposing this as something to be to go do where they have to actually keep these virus inoculums. Yeah, you get that. So, so we're struggling with that, how to actually enact this as maybe a, a, a screening technique. Um, because even within one lab at one time, getting a soup of virus that you can use this week versus next week is a challenge because they're, they're inhumant and messy and we don't have um, 
a sort of cell culture means of keeping viruses alive or isolating them. But, but we're hoping there, that there's a way to use you know, that um, those re responses are consistent enough that we'll be able to use that as a, a way to screen different lines of these. Um, these are maybe more details on the, the actual changes that we see in those bees. And the, the punchline here is that the resistant bees are basically holding the line on a lot of their processes. Um, metabolism, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, it's just kind of intuitive that they're, they're basically not, uh, the virus is not changing the bee physiology as much as it would otherwise. And it's, Probably these viruses have to get in. They have to take uh, sort of the, the ribosome, sexual protein-making machinery of their host, and these bees seem to be stopping uh, some of those uh, inroads. Of the virus. That's a it's a work in progress. We still I'm not a <laughs> certainly can't think to know that much about immunity towards viruses. So we're all we're taking these candidate genes and still debating and wondering what they mean for. Um, for a breeding trait, for an actual trait that might actually be, could be put into a, a lineage of these. Um, now I'm going to talk about um, sort of even more uh, gene-based approaches to bee health and the ability. We have a honeybee genome that's that's well vetted now. Lots of uh, you know, we know what we can infer at least from other species what a lot of the proteins do. Uh, we also now have resources for really anything that's bad that bees eat or get eaten by. So we have the viruses and the parasites, fungi and bacteria, and there should be a way to exploit the information on those other uh, partners of the bees to, to control them, to reduce them, and, and um, whether it's a chemical way or a, or a way that, that simply uh, looks at the, the cues that different parasites use, like the hive beetle and mites use to find their bee hosts. Uh, we're hoping that many people are, are banking on the fact that we can use the genetic information from those parasites to actually um, limit their growth. Uh, one such project is the Varroa Mike Genome Project, and that's um, in full swing still. Or it's a collaborative project across many different labs and institutes. Uh, it started unglamorously by pooling a bunch of mites from a single colony, and as Don is doing there, mashing them up to get their DNA. Um, and the really hard work on this and the biology part of it, um, and again, requiring lots of people with different insights and backgrounds, is to know how to translate those gene predictions or gene products into something biological for the mite. The three focus groups are development of the mites, organ development, uh, finding out how they queue into the larvae just at the right time, just before the cells are capped for the bees, and then finally how they find each other in the dark down there is just one uh, summary of, uh, and these are all public now, we have NCBI has the right protein sets and, and sequences available, um, but we're, we're trying now to, to annotate that to figure out which are especially tempting candidates for understanding my biology or even my control. Um, dozens of the candidates are dominantly those in the sample, and, that, and those are the perfect candidates for a sort of control method because um, if you can reduce those proteins by even a fraction, they, they should have some impact on fitness. Um, another sort of low-hanging fruit from this was identifying some microbes tied to the varroas and the varroa mites that we sequenced actually. On um, this case, one um, on the right, a, a bacterium that doesn't seem to show up as one of the natural ones in the honeybees, but it's in the varroa. And on the top, a, a DNA virus that, that um, again, is more often in mites than in bees. So we're, you know, maybe some exploring of how, how to exploit those as a um, Just to highlight, if, if those of you who are insect or my physiologists, and really need work by uh, a book by like Anna Cabrera on understanding my development. This is one of I think, four papers that she put out in a couple of years showing um, taking the candidates from the genome, but then really showing how they change the development and, and again how they might be used as a as a way to understand this mite reproduction in this case, or, or how mites find their, their bee hosts. And this is really exciting because it hasn't been done with girl mites before, and, and I think it, would, it could lead to an insight into how to, how to slow their development. Um, another uh, 
technique that's been now it, it seems like it's not such a recent technique. It's been bouncing around for um, well, in the first case since uh, about 22, 23 years is is RNA interference, uh, a means by which uh, double stranded RNAs in particular can inhibit the gene expression or the transcript abundance of their matches in an organism. And it works in mites. So if you put in a, a copy of it, a short copy of a gene sequence from the Varroa mite in a, in a double-stranded double molecule, that copy will lead to a process by which that gene will be kept silent. It won't be able to express its transcript and thereby expression. So, so this is working mechanistically in mites. There's a nice, nice study from the UK showing a knockdown of a, not the first candidate gene to remove mites, but at least a good proof of principle. Uh, there's, of course, industrial interest in this, or, or now um, commercial interest. And it looks promising. Uh, it's not something you're going to see on the shelf, unfortunately, because it, uh, I understand it, that, that just the production is it's still rather expensive. <laughs> but, it, but there is a very good chance that there could be a specific control for mites. Um, here's one statistic, again, sort of such as the nature of science. It's not drop, drop dead for the mites, but it shows that there is a quantitative decrease in mite levels. That's the Varroa per bees, which is a common metric of how many mites are in hives. And um, by using no chemicals, no, you know, no organophosphates or chemicals, they were able to knock down levels of the mites at the hive level by feeding them this, this product. So hopefully, I mean, I keep saying hopefully the last few years, but I think, I think at some point this will become a viable strategy for, for um, Okay, so I'm going to end there. Just wanted to acknowledge the, the group in Belsco. We have five uh, different laboratories there. Myself, Judy Chen, uh, Jeff Pettis, and now Stephen Cook, who's a toxicologist, looking at um, many of these interactive effects with pesticides, uh, and Miguel Corona, who's a new scientist, looking at the nutrition. So we're all um, trying to divvy up the, the myriad ways that these get healthy and get sick. And I, my lab is especially managed by Don Lopez, who's a technician in the USDA and runs, helps run all these tough experiments. Although this is my favorite part of the lab is actually feeding the bees for these experiments. So I get to actually feed them, but she does everything else. So I'm going to stop there and be happy to take questions.
sometimes something with any breathing solution, the, 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 the pain by the other means has to be really high of not using chemicals, say, I mean, of using chemicals. So I think in most cases, the chemical controls of mice have succeeded enough that beekeepers haven't been willing to spend double for a queen that's carefully bred for the resistance. But that's, that's tilting a bit, They're especially for um, some of the bigger breeders now are are able to market those resistant, resistant bees, but I think it's an economic thing in a sense. You're right, the traits have been recognized for a while. They're hard to maintain in a population, in an open mating species like a honeybee, in a sense, and so it's extra cost to kind of maintain and push them in, um, and that, that the market hasn't embraced that cost. So it's, it is constant relaxation following the loss exactly. of honey. There's, yeah. no, yeah. there's no retention of that. And, so we uh, I, well, I, I think overall in Europe and the U.S., the, the, in, let alone Brazil, where they don't treat the chemicals, resistance has risen. Um, it's still not at the point where it's economically enough that people can just afford to be not treated. What's that? Just in the interest in paying for it, it's cheaper. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it, but you know, and I don't know. It could be a top-down thing where they limit other controls, but that would be very painful for the beekeepers. They couldn't. They can't. hope is with genetic tools possibly one avenue that trait would be stable enough that it could be you know, more economical to mass produce those books. So if we get by and somebody gets by into you know, the big meat breeders in Georgia or even you know, California and and they can keep the trade in there without losing tons of money doing that, they will they'll do it.
asking a question because it's a question that I'm struggling with in my own work. So you presented some the survey work at the outset, right, where you have these correlations between presence of different viruses and what you see as a sick or a healthy colony. And I'm wondering how you deal with the interpretational challenges of that. So which way is the direction of causality? You know, are, the, are the sick colonies having more virus because they're sick and so their immune system is depressed? Or are those viruses actually making them sick? So yeah, how do you deal with that? I mean, historically, as a community, we usually overstated the virus role and don't prove it otherwise, which usually takes six months or so to <laughs> prove that it couldn't explain in every case of illness. But there are, no, that makes it, to be honest, though, there are very good studies, of, um, longitudinal studies with these viruses that show, and, and Benjamin's study, the overwintering one, I didn't talk about the, the, the back story there, but he was measuring the SEMA virus levels, so all sorts of diseases, and there are really pretty tight correlations with um, you know, risk ratios or, or increased risk of decline. So, so it's not just snapshots that aren't repeatable, which it sometimes feels like it's maybe we've done a lot of them where why didn't that work this time? Um, but there are cases where people have um, shown over time a predictive value of them where you, you can do it before the class. And, and so they're clearly involved with them. Um, it's just that for whatever reason, they, the same ones might be involved in one population and not in um, just qualitative. Basically, throughout the second part of your talk, you referred a number of times to different different effects, and you were sort of forced to say, from the perspective of a, of a as you said, a more, maybe more lab-based approach, this this should make a difference. Like this, we see a change in mice, and so I'm hope, you know, you're hopeful that this will make a difference. And so I wondered if you, as someone who's like part of these big teams, do you have someone in that team who is a modeler that is looking, say, at the at the dynamics of mite populations on colonies so that you could actually look at the set. I mean, how, so if you said, okay, well, we we can have this hygienic behavior or we can knock down resistance by X percent, a demographer or a population modeler would then be able to say that the trajectory of the mite population within that, that hive now ought to be negative and the, and the hive ought to be able to so rather than saying, you know, we sort of we hope in all of our disjoint labs that these various really elegant molecular techniques, it just seems like a, something in those big yeah. groups ought to. I, I think there are, I mean, yeah. and I, I'm not in any integral part of such a big group. There are modelers doing really nice work. It's actually with mites, you don't need to have negative population growth. You need to keep them, you know, decrease the curve by 30%. The viruses don't pick up part and parcel of that. So, so it's really looking at in March, looking at predicting what the mite load would be like in September when they they're generally high, generally passing lots of disease around. And so there are people showing that yeah, if you can ding that at the start by 30 percent, something like that, the, the net mite loads would be tenfold less, and that's probably sustainable. So there, yeah, there is that approach is going on. So we we kind of yeah, I mean, we go by the something that even our incremental decrease of my loads will affect colony health, but not the way. And I can't, like Eric or Elena might be able to say specific models that are, that are favored now, but there have, there have been good, good efforts, growth models basically, to do that. Okay, I'm going to hold that. I want to talk to the group who's in the group, and so we uh, have a 